official languages plus Portuguese and Hindi, and we will post the D Director General's remarks and an audio file of the press conference on the web as soon as possible. So now, without further delay, I will hand over to Dr. Tedros to give us his opening remarks. Dr. Tedros, you have the floor. Grazie mille, Margareta. <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Last week saw the first decline in newly reported cases globally since September due to a decrease in cases in Europe thanks to the effectiveness of difficult but necessary measures put in place in recent weeks. This is welcome news, but it must be interpreted with extreme caution. Gains can easily be lost, and there was still an increase in cases in most other regions of the world, and an increase in deaths. This is no time for complacency, especially with holiday season approaching in many cultures and countries. We all want to be together with the people we love during festive periods. But being with family and friends is not worth putting them or yourself at risk. We all need to consider whose life we might be gambling with in the decisions we make. The COVID-19 pandemic will change the way we celebrate, but it doesn't mean we can't celebrate. We still can celebrate. The changes you make will depend on where you live. Always follow your local or national guidelines. The first question to ask yourself is, do you need to travel? Do you really need to travel? For many people, this is a season for staying home and staying safe. Celebrate with your household and avoid gatherings with many different households and families coming together. If you do meet people from a different household, meet outdoors if you can. Maintain physical distance and wear a mask. Avoid crowded shopping centers, shop at less crowded times, and use online shopping if you can. If traveling is essential, take precautions to minimize the risk for you and others. Maintain distance from others and wear a mask when you're in airports and train stations and on planes, trains, and buses. Carry hand sanitizer with you or wash your hands frequently with soap and water. If you feel unwell, don't travel. If we can't celebrate as normal this year, make a plan to celebrate with your family and friends once it's safe to do so. We know it will be safe. It's a matter of time. The pandemic will end, and we all have a part to play in ending it. And we must remember that for millions of people, COVID-19 is only one health threat they face on a daily basis. Tomorrow is a World AIDS Day. The world has made incredible progress on HIV AIDS over the past 10 years. New HIV infections have declined by 23% since 2010, and AIDS-related deaths have fallen by 39%. A record 26 million people are on antiretroviral treatment. But the pace of increase has slowed. And that leaves 12 million people who are living with HIV but are not on treatment. And 12 million is big. That gap is jeopardizing our goal of ending AIDS 
as a public health threat by 2030. COVID-19 has had a profound effect on people living with HIV, as it has for many diseases. There is some evidence that people living with HIV may have an increased risk of severe disease and death from COVID-19. This increased risk has been compounded by disruptions to treatment for people living with HIV. In a WHO survey of 127 countries earlier this year, more than a quarter reported partial disruption to antiretroviral treatment for people with HIV. However, with support from WHO and the work of health and community workers, the number of countries reporting disruptions in HIV services has declined by almost 75% since June. This is a good news. Only nine countries are still reporting disruptions and only 12 report a critically low stock of antiretroviral medicines. This is mainly due to countries implementing WHO guidelines including providing longer prescriptions of antiretrovirals for three to six months. No patients can avoid health facilities. WHO has also worked closely with manufacturers and partners to ensure adequate supply of treatment. Countries have also introduced a number of effective adaptations and innovations during COVID-19. In Africa, many countries have built their testing system co for COVID-19 on the existing lab infrastructure for HIV and TB. In Thailand, the government has maintained pre-exposure prophylaxis services and telehealth counseling for men who have sex with men. And many countries have introduced more self-testing for HIV to support self-care and avoid the need for people to visit clinics or hospitals. WHO is urging, urging countries to maintain these innovations as part of the new normal and to help expand testing and treatment to people who need it. But if the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that in the face of an urgent health threat, the world can come together in new ways to defeat it. For many people, the pandemic is a source of fear but it can also be a source of hope that we can defeat COVID-19 and we can defeat HIV. And there is a lot of hope, especially with the advent of the vaccines that have been announced in the last few weeks. And from WHO side, we are sure that we can defeat this pandemic using the existing tools and also the vaccines that are in the pipe line. The most important thing is we need to have hope and not only hope, but solidarity to work together to fight a common enemy using the existing tools and also the new announcements of vaccines in the pipeline. I thank you. Back to you, Margareta. Grazie mille, 500 anni. Grazie mille, Dr. Tedros. Uh, so now I will open the floor to questions. As I mentioned before, uh, Dr. Meg Doherty is here. She's our director of our global HIV programs to answer your questions related to um, World AIDS Day tomorrow. So please take the advantage of such expertise. Uh, we will um, 
as, as you know, I'm sure use the raise your right hand icon to get in the queue to ask your questions. And I would also have to remind you that we restrict this question to one per journalist, though you're all, you have all been terrific about this. So without further ado, I will give the first question to pa Carmen from Politico. Uh, Carmen, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Hi, Margaret, thank you. I do have a question for Dr. Mark Ryan. I was wondering if you could tell us at all um, the way the experts um, in the origin, um, virus origin mission were selected, how many they are, and if you can give us more or less a timeline of when the names will be made public, thank you. Um, hi, uh, I think the names uh, are public. Um, and the, uh, the, the selection, we put out a call, I think, to, 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 uh, for, a, for, for, for names and suggestions for the team. Uh, and the process was to select a diverse group of individuals representing a geographically diverse uh, group who represent the necessary expertise. And that was really across uh, um, veterinary science, medical science, uh, as well as laboratory science and especially people who would have uh, uh, experience of uh, investigations at the animal-human uh, interface. Uh, I'll pass to, to, to Maria if she has any supplemental, but it would have been very much the, the normal way we pick expert groups and the way we select for our missions in trying to balance uh, the need for the highest quality individuals with their expertise, but also representing a broad diversity of geographies uh, to represent the international community in this regard. Maria? There's not really much to add, just to say they are online. Um, we have made them available online. I think they've been up for a week or two. If, if not, we could provide the link to you if you don't know where those are. Uh, we also have published the terms of reference for the international team. Um, who have met and who continue to meet to, to make the plans. But as Mike has said, it's a diverse group of individuals with um, various technical backgrounds, um, a good geographic representation um, to make sure that they have the right technical background to be able to assist um, in the studies that are needed to evaluate the virus origins and the intermediate hosts. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, that's a very important question and thank you so much, our colleague from Politico. Uh, the terms of reference has been announced, posted. The names of experts have been announced. And I would like to assure you that WHO's position is very, very clear. We need to know the origin of this virus because it can help us to prevent future outbreaks. And we're doing everything to make sure that we know the origin. And this is a technical issue. And I would like to say some have been politicizing this, although we have been doing our best to know the origin, but some have been politicizing it. WHO's position has been very clear that we will start the study from Wuhan, know what has happened there, and then based on the findings we have there, to explore if there are other avenues that we have to explore. And our strong has been, our position has been very clear and very strong. And we're working to make sure that the origin is of the virus is known because it helps the world to understand the genesis and prevent future outbreaks. This is not for WHO alone to work with on, by the way. We're working with FAO we're working with OIA. And in the expert team, we have representatives from WHO, from FAO, from OIA. And we have international experts from various countries, from the UK, from the United States, from Japan, from South Korea, from Sudan, you name it. But it's already posted. 
So one thing we would like to advise is that please let's not politicize this. We're doing everything we can based on science. And what has been a barrier and trying to derail us from what we have been doing scientifically was the politicization of the study of the origin of the virus from some quarters. But WHO is committed to do everything it can based on science and solutions to find the origin. And that's the basics. We need to do the basics. And we will not stop from knowing the truth on the origin of the virus, but based on science, without politicizing it or trying to create uh, tension in the, in the process. And we call upon everybody, actually, to cooperate on this. And from our side, we will be as transparent as possible. And that's why we have posted the TORs. That's why we have posted the list of experts. And anything forward will be posted openly for you, journalists, and others, the public, to see. There is nothing to hide. We want to know the origin. That's it. As much as you want to know the origin of the virus, we do want to know the origin of the virus because it will help us to present, prevent future outbreaks. So I don't want to have any confusion on that. I want you to have clarity on that. Our position is we want to know the origin and we will do everything to know the origin. Please, you don't, have, you don't need to have any, any confusion on this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. Uh, the next question goes to Laurent from Swiss News. Laurent, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this morning, uh, teams of uh, researchers from the Zurich Institute of Technology uh, disclosed a new device that would reduce the number of uh, health workers required to change the position of a patient uh, in ACU from back to uh, uh, laying a face down position uh, from uh, five health workers required to three. So as in uh, many countries, the heads of ICUs have said that the, the problem is, is not necessarily the number of beds, but no, the number of qualified health workers uh, uh, at their disposal. Could that be a game changer? And, and do you have uh, other examples of devices, not products, that could be critical in the, in the fight against the pandemic? Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm not really maybe aware, but uh, I'm not aware of that. But we, we do know from uh, observations of frontline workers that proning of patients in intensive care, that is placing them on their fronts and not their backs, has proved to be uh, a useful way of <clears throat> helping patients through the most difficult phase uh, of their their own response uh, and their own uh, uh, survival and recovery. And I think it's important to note that not all innovation happens in distant labs uh, and in academic uh, situations. A lot of innovation comes from observations by frontline workers, uh, trying and testing through experience, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't work, and then sharing those observations with others. <clears throat> and I think we'd like to commend all of those frontline workers who've done so much in improving clinical pathways in general and improving the standard of care, because what's really helping patients is not just uh, specific <clears throat> drugs like dexamethasone. If you look at survival rates increasing over the last six to 12 months, a lot of that has been because, number one, we're getting patients who are likely to deteriorate into care earlier, and that means being able to monitor and predict who's likely to become sicker based on underlying conditions or their oxygen saturation or their peak flow or their ability to, <clears throat> to exchange air in their lungs. There are many uh, observations there that have helped to prioritize patients in the clinical pathway. Um, obviously, um, <clears throat> being able to decide which patients will or won't benefit from ventilation or different kinds of respiratory support, the availability of high flow medical oxygen and ensuring that people get that in time. There are so many <clears throat> innovations that have come 
and these have come from frontline health workers and teams together making observations as to what works in certain circumstances so we will commend those it is important though that those observations are taken beyond that into observational studies and potentially into trials that help to determine exactly what the benefit is coming from and how to expand that benefit into the practice of others. We have living clinical guidelines. Uh, one of the things I think that's remarkable of this response is that everything is changing so quickly in clinical practice that we have a living guideline that's essentially being updated in real time with these kinds of, uh, of, of observations. Um, again, just as an example, and again, we, we, we really thank our external partners on this. The use of, of medical oxygen is not just about uh, uh, oxygen delivery at the site of the patient. It's managing the whole process of getting oxygen to the healthcare facility, managing the distribution of oxygen within that facility, and using that safely. And that's required changes in practice, changes in the supply, even down to the size of tubing that's been used, uh, whether we're using um, uh, oxygen in bottles or using oxygen concentrators and ensuring that health workers are trained to use all of that. And there's been a tremendous amount of work done to really innovate around the supply uh, of high quality oxygen uh, and make many countries self-sufficient in the, in the production of medical oxygen for their own needs. Uh, so I would say that this kind of frontline innovation is hugely important. And uh, again, commending frontline workers for not only doing the brave thing and the courageous things that they do, but learning and observing what's working and then sharing that with the broader clinical, um, medical and nursing community. So Maria may wish to add, but uh, we can only welcome initiatives like this. We will <clears throat> definitely look at the, if you can reduce uh, a labor intensive process, such as proning the patient from five to three health workers, and you can do that safely, and I, I add the word safely, then clearly that's going to be an innovation that will help in reducing the demand on, on already exhausted frontline workers. Maria? Yeah, thanks, Mike. I'm not aware of that particular study, but just to add that these innovations that we've seen in, in high-income settings, low-income settings, are really pushing the boundaries of, of how we can better care for patients. And Mike described that um, very clearly. But what I do want to say is while we can increase innovation and while we can increase our capacity to develop and produce supplies, we don't have that same ability to accelerate the uh, increase in the workforce because of the training that is required for individuals to be able to care for patients. We've seen incredible um, efforts across the world to, to have students and medical students um, you know, advance, uh, you know, come forward to, to be able to care for patients and help supporting in the care of patients. We've seen volunteers come, come forward. We've seen retirees come forward, come out of retirement. But I just want to highlight that while we can increase the innovations, and that is really advancing our ability to, to keep, uh, to care for patients and to keep health workers safe, we don't have that same capacity to increase the health workforce. And I would be remiss if I didn't add that we need, as individuals, to do everything we can to prevent ourselves from getting infected and needing to be cared for in a health facility. Um, I, we cannot emphasize this enough. The burden on the healthcare facilities, on healthcare workers right now in many countries across the world is really astounding. Um, while case numbers are declining in a number of countries, the numbers of deaths are increasing. The demands on health workers are increasing. And so we must do everything that we can, especially as the Director General has said through the holiday season and into the new year, do what we can to protect ourselves and protect our loved ones um, because Health workforce right now is a finite capacity, um, and we just need to all play our part um, to try to prevent us from needing that, that care in the first place. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Kerkhoff. So the next question comes from, goes to John Miller of Reuters. John, could you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, thank you very much for taking my question. Um, at the outset, you talked about uh, eliminating unnecessary travel uh, for the upcoming holidays. There's a broad discussion going on, on among numerous countries in, in, in Europe and, and beyond about the appropriateness of holding a, a ski season. Uh, some countries favor it, some countries are opposed to it. Um, in general, skiing requires either short distance or long distance travel. What is the WHO's position on holding a ski season and can it be done safely or should uh, countries uh, stop skiing for the year and, until there is a, a solution to the virus? Thanks. 
So thanks for this. I can, I can start and, and maybe Mike would like to add here. Um, in terms of all of these questions specific to a ski season or specific to travel or specific to any, um, any activity, um, what WHO advises is a risk-based approach um, in terms of what can be done, um, how it can be done, um, if it can be postponed and if it can't be postponed, how it can be done safely. Skiing is no different. Um, there are different countries, uh, you know, that are, that are um, looking at uh, whether to keep it open or to close it, whether they can keep it open in a safe manner. But what WHO has outlined are ways in which people can reduce the opportunities for them to be infected. If the virus is circulating in, in an area, um, and if people are in close contact in that area, the virus can spread. It's as simple as that. And so what are the measures that need to be taken to be able to minimize that risk, minimize that opportunity for spread? Um, so there are ways in which different activities can be held um, safely or in a more safe manner, but right now there is no zero risk. And while we are definitely seeing some improvements in, in case incidents in many countries across Europe, um, it has come at quite some high cost due to the, the stay-at-home measures and the other restrictive measures that have been put in place. We really need to remain vigilant in terms of everything that we could do to prevent that spread. Um, so it needs to be a risk-based approach in looking at what policies uh, decision makers need to be put in place, taking into account the circulation of the virus, the measures that can be put in place to keep people physically distant from one another, um, to make sure that we, we don't uh, give the virus an opportunity to spread further. Yeah, I, I, I agree, Maria. This is, really has to be a, a, a risk-managed approach. And uh, the risk in this is not necessarily um, skiing itself, I, I, I suspect. Uh, Many people won't be infected for barreling down the slopes uh, in, on their skis. The, the real issues are going to come at airports, um, uh, on tour, on buses taking people to and from ski resorts, uh, ski lifts, and places where pe pinch points in in the skiing sort of experience, where people come together in large numbers, uh, and there are pinch points in that. Uh, not to mention the après ski that so many people seem to enjoy uh, is another issue. So here you're dealing with issues of airline transport, bus transport, uh, the open air closing of bars. It's not just about skiing, it's a much broader issue. So I don't think we should be reducing this down to skiing or ski season. What every government needs to be looking at is all forms of gatherings that lead to people congregating or moving at, en masse and how they're going to de-risk those processes. If they don't believe those processes can be de-risked enough, then curtailing, postponing, uh, or <clears throat> managing it in that way. And I think rather than targeting the ski season, the next thing it'll be spring season and the hiking season, and then we'll be, you know, it, it, we had the previous issue in summer and holiday. So I, I, I think rather than targeting the actual activity, it's important for governments now to look at the risk management end to end in this process. So governments who are potentially don't have skiing as part of their uh, uh, economic uh, <clears throat> activity may be sending lots of people to go skiing who may return with the risk. So it's not just the places in which skiing occurred, it's the risk that ex that's exchanged between locations based on the movement of people. It's not that they went skiing or they're going skiing, that's not the issue. The issue is any activity the inv that involves large numbers of people moving into a concentrated space and then using public and other transport to get there and back needs to be managed carefully and it needs to be managed, as Maria said, with a very much a risk management approach. Uh, we don't hold a position on whether something should be cancelled or not cancelled because the circumstances change in each and every jurisdiction. <clears throat> so we would advise that all countries look at the, their ski season and other reasons for mass gathering, be they uh, uh, sports, or recreation or uh, religious, uh, and, and, and looks very, very carefully at the end-to-end -end risks associated with, with that. We are heading in, and um, we are in the middle of a deep uh, moment of transmission. We've seen great progress made, certainly in Europe, um, over the last number of weeks, as the DG said, with the application of measures, however difficult, have reduced in the turning around of that. We want to maintain that progress. Um, uh, and uh, as we say, there are, there are travels that are needed, people, uh, uh, may need to, to travel for all kinds of different reasons. Uh, the question is whether travel is considered to be essential or necessary, um, and in that, uh, I think countries are going to have to look 
at mass recreation and see whether or not that can be managed within their current risk management framework. Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan and Dr. Van Kerkhove. So I think we we'll now move from snow to uh, tropical region of Brazil, uh, because we have Bianca from, from Globo. Bianca, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, Margaret. Can you hear me? Very well, Bianca. Please go ahead. Thanks a lot. Um, so, yeah, here, Bianca Rottier. I'm correspondent in Switzerland for Globo, the largest TV network in Brazil. And my question is, again, on Brazil. Brazil clearly sees an increase in the number of cases and deaths. And uh, my, my question is probably to Mike and Maria. What is your main concern with Brazil at this point in time? And technically, does WHO see it as a second wave or is Brazil still facing the first wave? Thanks. Um, I think we uh, <laughs> spoke pretty extensively about this on Friday. Um, and I think, uh, as I said then, it's not a specific concern related to Brazil. It's a general concern uh, related to Central and South America, where many countries have fought very hard to get their numbers down. The numbers have not returned to extremely low levels, so many countries are still uh, moving along with, you know, with reasonable, but you know, they're not low numbers. And the, the, the difficulty now is in some countries, as they begin to see a rising number of cases, they need to look at that at national and sub-national level. So even in the case of Brazil, the disease numbers are going down in a number of states, but rising in others. So I think it's about looking at the problem now and being very, very clear and very, very directed. Where, where, is, uh, where are cases jumping back up? What's driving that uh, rise in cases? What can be done at that sub-national level to deal with that? Very much like the, the first waves. Uh, whether you call this a, a, a second wave or a surge within the first wave, we could be, we can have those pedantics all night. The fact remains that the numbers are increasing again in a number of countries, and that must be addressed. But that increase is very unlikely to be everywhere at the same time. It's very likely, as it happened in Europe, to be occurring in specific zones, and we need to look at those zones and see whether or not we can act fast and implement measures that will be aimed at suppressing the numbers of disease so that the health system stays uh, intact uh, as it did before and again the the, 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 the the healthcare workers of Brazil did a fantastic job in, in during the previous peak uh, in maintaining basic capacity of the health system to deliver uh, across the country that was uh, a gargantuan task so again my advice would be look at the sub-national level look at where the increases are occurring uh, ensure that we have rapid action in those areas, both to contain the disease and support the health system. Um, and, and we all know the complexities of responding uh, to COVID, particularly in, in, in countries that have both deeply rural and very, very urbanized settings. And within those urbanized settings, a very different profile in the population uh, from the very wealthy to people living in, in slums and, and, and who have very little access to, to services. So it's a very diverse situation, Not no one size fits all, but we want to avoid the health system coming under huge pressure and we want to take action as quickly as possible in the areas where we see the disease jumping back uh, up. That, does, that advice is not just for, for Brazil, that, that really is for any country um, facing a, 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 a rebound in, in, in its cases. And you'll see in, in the case of Europe um, how countries that reacted quickly to the, the, the new numbers seem to have done pretty well in suppressing those numbers and protecting their health, uh, their health system. And now, hopefully, with a continued follow-through, and we would like to see that follow-through in Europe, to follow through with low numbers of cases and then begin to introduce vaccines. If we have follow-through on low numbers of cases, then other health services can continue to recover, and Meg is here to speak about that from the perspective of HIV. Um, and we need that. We need the system to be able to not just survive COVID. It's got to deliver other services. Uh, and it's got to recover that capacity to deliver a full service to everybody. Um, and that would be the same in Brazil or anywhere else. So we're not just trying to get the COVID numbers down for the sake of getting the COVID numbers down. We're trying to get the COVID numbers down so the health system can get back to what it's supposed to be doing, which is preventing and treating other diseases um, 
risk at the same time. Uh, so the advice goes for Brazil as it goes for everyone else. I don't know, uh, Maria or Meg, if you want to, to add. Very, very briefly, and then I'll pass to Meg. Um, I think the, it, it's the same advice for all countries as Mike has just said. It's tailor the approach. It's look at what your data is telling you on where the virus is circulating, where the intense activity is, and tailor and target your interventions to really bring it down further. And then second, bring it down, keep it down follow through. We've seen so many countries that have brought transmission under control, areas that have brought transmission under control, and they haven't been able to keep it low because, because of a number of reasons. Bring it low, keep it low, follow through. Maintain your vigilance, maintain activities, and really jump on any cases that, that begin, um, you know, so that they don't have the opportunity to seed into something further. And that is advice that is for every country on every continent of the planet. Um, right now, but really, um, it, it's important that when you've been able to bring it down, you keep it down. Meg. Thank you very much, and I think that's really quite important right now as tomorrow we're heading into celebrating World AIDS Day, and this year the theme of World AIDS Day is global solidarity, resilient services. So I think it really builds upon the conversation that you're having here, and also the concern about how, what can we do in either a second or a third wave or cases, because what we've seen um, in at least HIV services is that early on we saw some dipping in terms of the number of people getting tested, the number of people getting put onto treatment, and that can have effects over the long term of increased deaths, increased new infections. But we've seen over since June up until November sort of a rebound where as the cases are lower, uh, systems have been able to regroup and put more people back onto therapy, shore up their ARV stocks, make sure that they have adequate supplies, ensure that the healthcare workers are doing multiple tests, not only taking care of COVID testing, combining COVID and HIV testing with TB testing, so that essentially really that the healthcare workers can start to rebuild and build back better. So as we move until tomorrow, World AIDS Day, we also know that many of the infectious diseases, we heard about malaria today, we'll hear about the reporting in HIV, we're having a bit of a plateau. And the COVID on top of that can, can actually increase the sort of the, the, the catch up that we need to do as we start to have a scenario where we can have these essential services working at 100%. So we, we're really going to be calling upon healthcare workers to, and countries and governments to maintain and, and engage and protect their healthcare workers. And for HIV, that's a particularly important for community-led and community-based healthcare workers, and com as well as nurses and midwives in this year of the nurse and the midwives. We're also, as was mentioned earlier, really looking to take all those innovations that have come out during COVID, whether it's putting more into the hands of the person, person-centered care, having therapies that can go home with them for three to six months, having self-testing, self-collection of, of tests and or um, other medicines. More of that can be done as we move forward so that we can protect people who need to take their medicines and people who need to be coming into the clinic, but they don't have to come in every single time. And lastly, we want to ensure that these disruptions are maintained, uh, that the lack of disruptions and that the build back in disruptions are maintained as we move forward. I would have to say also there's going to be always with World AIDS Day some very exciting news. There's news around um, new prevention measures that are going to be available for uh, people um, such as the Depivirine ring. We have seen news reports around long-acting inject injectable prevention, innovations around new drugs for children at very low prices so that the youngest children can have dolutegravir. We believe all these innovations have to come together so that we can actually work towards uh, ending uh, AIDS as a public health threat by 2030. So. Um, I think that ties it up going back to maintaining these services and we're hoping that with the next waves or, or in the spring and the summer that we won't have to see dips again where we have to work back, that, that we maintain the, the actual hard work that all the healthcare workers are doing right now to, to maintain the numbers. Thanks. Margarita. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Meg. Uh, thank you, Mike and Maria.
I just would like to add uh, one thing, uh, because I want Brazil to take it seriously. Um, as you may know, the number of cases in Brazil reached its climax on the week of July 17, which is 319,000 per week, which is a record. And then the good news was it was declining. Um, the number of cases were declining until November, the week of November 2, which is 114 cases per week. So it's almost a third of what has been reported when it reached its climax. But now, on the week of November 26, it's back again to, to 218,000 per week. So 319,000 when it reached its climax in July, started to go down until it reached 114 cases per week in November 2 and back to 218,000. So from November 2 to November 26, it has again doubled. And the death rate also, it has been declining until November 2 and now it's increasing significantly. If you take the November 2, the week of November 2 cases, it's 2,538. And now we have 3,876, meaning it's a significant increase between November 2, the week of November 2, and the week of November 16. That's from 2,538 days per week to 3,876 days per week. So I think uh, Brazil has to be very, very serious. And as what uh, Mike uh, said, um, there are local transmissions that's fueling and contributing more. But if you see the aggregate, it's very, very worrisome. Thank you. Margaret, just to maybe add, uh, <clears throat> I agree with, uh, with Tedros's comments there, but just to make and 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 and, and the theme in HIV and people in TB and malaria and non-communicable diseases in the mental health uh, program and the in the sexual reproductive health program in immunisation in child health and that's here and at country level and out there in the front line. This has been a hugely demanding 11 months. It's one thing to have to respond to COVID and the resources are there to do that and the attention is there. It's much harder and it's been much harder for frontline workers and health workers and hospital workers to continue to deliver all of these other services when the attention and the resources um, and the visibility is all on the other side of the equation. Uh, and uh, the DG has said this many times, uh, we don't get enough opportunity to thank those who've kept all of those services going and kept them ticking over and now are helping them to recover. Those services would not be recovering so quickly unless people had really kept that engine running right the way through the really bad times in this pandemic. So I think the world, uh, we all owe a great debt of gratitude to those individuals and teams who've been non-COVID working, delivering on those services uh, right the way through. And they're, those workers, in my view, are more heroic because it's harder to be a hero when nobody's watching. It's harder to be a hero uh, when uh, nobody's listening. So uh, like it's uh, an opportunity for us to recognize the role that all of these services have played right the way through. I know the DG speaks of this all the time, but uh, on the event of, you know, with uh, World AIDS Day tomorrow, I think it's time to celebrate what can be done and uh, HIV AIDS program and others have led the way on things like equity and access and all these principles that we expound for COVID-19. I think we need to follow the path of, of the programs who managed to generate equity and of access to, to essential services for these diseases. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and staying on HIV, Simon Ateba would like to ask a question on HIV. Simon, could you unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, thank you, Margaret. Thank you for having me. This is Simon Ateba from Today News Africa in Washington, D.C. Uh, South Africa continues to have the largest number of people living with HIV and AIDS. Uh, 
But over the past decade, the country has made significant progress. It has reduced new transmission by 60% and death by also 60%. Is there anything that South Africa is doing right? Uh, uh, and can we learn anything from COVID-19 to uh, tackle HIV and AIDS in, in the world? Thank you. Thank you for that question. I would have to say uh, there's a lot that South Africa has done right. And uh, I think South Africa really has to be uh, congratulated for, a bunch, uh, for much of the work that they've been doing over the last many years because they have the largest burden of people living with HIV. And uh, one, one, a few examples of what has gone really well is a focus on um, uh, decentralization of their treatment program, ensuring that it's integrated with uh, what's considered sort of a nurse-based approach, using community healthcare workers to support the HIV program. Over the past year, you've been transitioning to using the optimal therapy, including dolutegravir, and you've been forerunners in the work around maternal and child health, reduction of uh, mother-to-child transmission through good ANC program and what we call PMTCT programs, as well as uh, finding and treating all of your children and testing them to the best of your abilities. And certainly another area where you're really standing out is you're starting to work on prevention. South Africa has very high risks uh, among adolescent girls and young women. And I think this is the time now where South Africa, who has been taking pre-exposure prophylaxis very seriously, but to really expand that and make sure that young women, young men, have access to good prevention services, including what we call PrEP, or either a pill, a uh, depivirine ring, or in the long term and over the next several years, potentially injections that can protect them from becoming infected. So I have to say on World AIDS Day, I, South Africa gets a, a gold star, but there needs to be more work done and certainly uh, greater coverage attained to be able to control and, and achieve the, the end of AIDS as a, as a public health threat in the near future. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Doherty. Uh